Welcome to the new Cyber Frontier, bringing you the latest news and initiatives that focus on the development of cybersecurity economics. You don't have to be a computer or cybersecurity expert to get plugged in. Your host brings it straightforward, asks the tough questions, and brings the cyber world to a level of understanding for everyone. You can find us on the web at www.newcyberfrontier.com. Now join our host as he introduces the topic for today's New Cyber Frontier. Okay, welcome to a new edition of uh, New Cyber Frontier. I'm your host, Timothy Montgomery, and today I have with me a gentleman that I'm pretty sure I know on the campus of uh, UCCS, uh, Toby uh, uh, Combi. Did I get that right? Combi? <laughs> oh, yeah. Perfect. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. So, um... Yeah, Toby. So good to see you. You know, um, I know that just in passing sometimes, I know we get on that campus and we go crazy and, and you get in those classes and uh, you never know what to expect. And it's, it's just a constant going from place to place on those campus some days. So, I mean, a lot of a lot of good stuff going on. Uh, it's been quite a bit of time since uh, we have uh, you know been on the campus, right? And uh, oh, yeah. this COVID. Yeah, I've, I've actually kinda, missed that. Yeah, I yeah, know me too sometimes. Um, so, you know, getting to see you in person versus uh, these, you know, video sessions per se. Um, so um, I do not like to drive though. I have to drive all the way like 40 minutes to get there. So anyway. No, that's um, not cool. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's just <laughs> that's just something I got to do to get there. But it's always nice to be on campus. And uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the cybersecurity and uh, graduates. And I know Toby... You and I, we've been in the graduate course uh, for uh, University of Colorado, Colorado Springs, for quite some time now. You, preferably longer than I have, um, so you're a little further along, uh, if not almost finished, I'm assuming. Um, so, no, I, so I actually graduated last year, so ah, I'm, I'm kind of done for now, so yeah. Let's do this. Uh, if you would, introduce yourself, give me a little bit of your background, and currently what you're doing. All right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, team for having me on this uh, show today. Sure. Um, my name is Toby and uh, Toby Akombi, just like the same way Tim pronounced it earlier. <laughs> and um, yes, I, I am uh, very interested in cybersecurity. I've been uh, doing a lot on cybersecurity for um, a little bit over 10 years now. Um, I finally got my PhD to show that I do have um, the academic background. Uh, but again, as we all know, with cybersecurity, it's more of your experience that actually shows, um, well, that tells the tale of your expertise. And um, other than um, doing cybersecurity, I, I currently work for an internet facing um, organization. Um, I probably, uh, I can mention the name of the organization. It's actually Cloudflare, but uh, that is how far I can discuss on this uh, show. But with all that being said, um, I think I'm more of an open book. Um, I do have a LinkedIn page and uh, my name is exactly the way it's been pronounced. So if you want to know more about me, uh, please reach out via uh, the LinkedIn. And um, yeah, I think uh, that is all for now, Tim. Oh, thanks, Toby. Thanks for that introduction. So going to UCCS, and you graduated last year, um, I'm sure you miss it um, as much as I do. Oh, yeah. We were talking about. The <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, but you were teaching. You were doing a lot of the background for a lot of the professors there, even before, you know, you got into it. And, then, you know, what did you actually do for your dissertation? What was that like? Well, my dissertation was actually very interesting. In fact, up until now, I'm still uh, um, very, in fact, if you get me started on discussing my dissertation, I think we probably won't have enough time to go <laughs> on here, you know, but then uh, just just in brief, um, yeah, because I mean, because if, if, if you ask me, that is my bragging right, you know, but yeah, my, my, my area of specialization uh, for my thesis was on software defined networking. And um, this is uh, a networking paradigm that actually um, was given birth like in the early um, 2000s, I would say, um, to be precise, around uh, 2012. Uh, before that, we've had other components um, that have been in the making, like um, OpenFlow and um, all that communication channel. However, um, 
software defined networking itself is just the way it's out software defined networking now uh just a little recap on uh what my aspect what my area was all about because it's actually very broad um so if you i mean before I actually dive into that, just think of like having um, a router or a switch in your house. And um, those things that you can get at Best Buy for less than $50 for some of the um, commodity ones, you, you probably look at them as like just being like a dummy um, switch or like a dummy router, you know, but when we move a little bit um, up to the industrial level, we do have some switches that are way powerful than a lot of the laptops out there. So the question is, if these things are just dumb switches, I mean, again, dumb in the sense that they're only supposed to uh, be used to forward um, information going over the internet, all we're using them for, then the question is, how can we really um, claim that we're actually making use of the resources that is being provided by the hardware itself? And this is where SDN comes in. So with SDN, all it's doing is now we can actually offload some of the controls that we actually use um, before now in middle boxes, say for instance, firewall and um, load balancers, we can now offload that uh, from the middle boxes and actually put them on this edge routers or edge switches, you know, so that they can compensate for the capacity in terms of processing that we can um, um, benefit from some of this hardware. So again, I don't want to get lost in this conversation because sure. this is like my best uh, um, yes. side of, yeah. <laughs> if, if you talk about my dissertation, yeah, it's, get, yeah, it's going to take like forever. Yeah, well, this is yeah. specific. So we're Toby, we're going to take a break right quick and uh, we'll be right back uh, after this message from our sponsors. Blockframe technology offers next generation blockchain managed trust and security. Unique non-fungible tokens are used to secure software bills of materials to provide data quality and security for every transaction in your supply chain. Deploy advanced peer-to-peer -peer product security, scale zero trust capability to millions of IoT devices, allow vendor tracking and accountability, and rapidly reset from compromise. Unchangeable, time-sequenced blockchain data provides next-generation security using machine learning trust algorithms and audit analytics. Start securing your supply chain today by contacting BlockFrame at www.blockframetech.com. Okay, we're back. Uh, New Cyber Frontier. I'm your host, Timothy Montgomery, and we're here with Toby. Um, graduating last year from UCCS, a uh, very interesting conversation before the, before the message. Uh, or the commercial there um, about uh, how networking in general from the dissertation he had to supply and conquer and debate. Um, yeah, managed to get that PhD. Um, I know it's lots of years of effort in there about uh, how those aspects work. Um, and in depth analysis, a little bit about how networking in general and how um, distributing those types of, uh, I guess you can call them assets really, um, or categories and different rule sets, I guess you can say, implies to how packets move from, you know, uh, A location to B location uh, and how those different right. integral pieces are applied to one another as far as rule sets, right? So uh, very good um, conversation there about different aspects of how we uh, cybersecurity-wise um, can deploy new versions or better versions uh, and offload certain things to different, I guess, devices within the network to better distribute uh, how packets are maneuvered or the, I, I would have to say the responsibility of those devices. Right. 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 Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, in your, in, in the world of cybersecurity in the last five or 10 years, and I would have to say in the next five or 10 years, um, I mean, the history of cybersecurity seems to be moving at a certain rate where over the last five or 10 years, and as an academic standpoint, um, it's maturing. Like we're evolving, um, we're growing into um, being a part of the business school where we are maneuvering into basically our own category and our own department. Um, we're getting more and more, uh, um, you know, sophisticated when it comes to what the uh, amount of budget and things like that that seems to be playing roles and in kind of section itself up to a point where 
it's no longer cybersecurity or computer science department. Now you have your own department as far as cybersecurity. At UCCS, did you see any of those trends in the last five years, 10 years? Um, and I mean, what was, what was your analysis on just where were they coming from? And then where did they go to and what do you see next? Well, that's a very beautiful uh, question, Tim. Um, so uh, with UCCS, um, I think a quick background on how I actually got to UCCS would uh, suffice here. Yeah. So um, I can I can actually say that, uh, let me see if I can do my maths correctly now. Yeah, I can say that like seven years ago um, when I was trying to um, start up my graduate's degree in security. Um, it, it was very hard for me to locate a university in the United States that was actually offering um, cybersecurity at a PhD level. Yeah. And um, a lot of these other departments um, in these big universities, they do claim that they have like a security breakout um, but however, it's still on the computer science canopy, you know, and that kind of made it hard for me to actually believe if this was actually the cybersecurity that I was looking for, right. just a mixed flavor of computer science and networking, you know. So um, UCCS is one of uh, the, the schools that started um, the cybersecurity program at a PhD level. And yes, we're still growing. Um, do we have other um, competent schools? Yes, we do. Uh, but the good thing about UCCS is that they, they started this program um, to stand on its own. Even though it still feels like we're sharing the same department with computer science, of course, everything is still um, on the computer science, as you know, as it is everywhere else. Yeah. Um, however, the degree is different. You know, at the end of the day, it's not like you need to really explain to people that, hey, guess what? I did graduate with a PhD in computer science, but then my focus was security. Yeah. Um, I used to see as you're actually graduating with a PhD in security. And as, as it is, it's more of security engineering meaning that you cannot graduate without actually um, adding to the status quo of uh, the security environment in terms of implementation. And, um, um, and of course, on the security, we have a lot of things that you can fit into as well. But um, so that I don't get carried away from the question here, uh, between the time that I joined um, UCCS and the time I graduated, I saw a lot of improvement and I, I think that um, in the next five years, it's going to be uh, way, way robust than what we have currently. Yeah, you know, the, the way I'm, you know, right. And, and the, the progression that I'm looking for actually will be to, um, in order for the graduating students from cybersecurity to really, you know, reap what they've sown so far, they need to be able to um, graduate and be ready for the industry. Yeah. So I think bringing in more industrial affiliation will be great uh, for the department moving forward. That's what I see for the future of um, cybersecurity at UCCS. Yeah, and I, I think I've seen in there a lot of uh, internships, a lot of companies stepping forward, looking for graduates from UCCS, looking to give them that experience and, and giving them encouragement to, to go out and get that uh, that cybersecurity certification like uh, the uh, CISSP um, and the right. basic uh, uh, SEC Plus, which is a CompTIA's a certification, very basic stuff there. Um, and it's also as a, uh, I don't know if you got this, but uh, as, as a part of my degree curriculum, I have to show that I actually am certified with a CISSP or I've got to have so many uh, months of internship to, to um, kind of meet that requirement there. So that was a part of it that might have changed over the past couple of years. Uh, so they're starting to integrate more of the idea of your um, your modern you know certification uh, factors that certainly will play a role in getting jobs, uh, especially with the Department of Defense. Um, they always looking at that uh, the eighty five seventy and uh, that manual that gives the chart in it. Blockframe technology offers next generation blockchain managed trust and security. Unique non-fungible tokens are used to secure software bills of materials to provide data quality and security for every transaction in your supply chain. 
deploy advanced peer-to-peer -peer product security, scale zero trust capability to millions of IoT devices, allow vendor tracking and accountability, and rapidly reset from compromise. Unchangeable, time-sequenced blockchain data provides next-generation security using machine learning trust algorithms and audit analytics. Start securing your supply chain today by contacting BlockFrame at www.blockframetech.com. Um, so, and in your, you've been for a year, so there's, as you come out from getting your graduate degree, did you, did you have a lot of job opportunities or was it, was it hard to find or, I mean, what happened as far as your experiences there? Oh, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's a very interesting, uh, question. Um, yeah. So, um, before I graduated, actually, I was, uh, lucky, I will say lucky, um, to be amongst, um, the founding fathers of a cybersecurity club at UCCS. And, um, this was something that I've always wanted to do. You know, I believe that as a cybersecurity student, um, it's not just about the academics alone. You need to have more exposure to what is actually going on in the security world. And in order to have those kind of, um, that level of exposure, um, you should be able to compete with other universities. You should be able to go for cyber force um, competitions, CTFs, and you know those things are actually great um, resource or recipe to actually um, use to cook up your resume at the end of the day. So, well, um, a semester before I graduated, I, I actually had um, very fantastic offers, and um, it wasn't hard at that time well speaking of 2019 now a lot of things have changed afterwards That's you know true. but then um i yeah i did i did start early and this is always my advice to a lot of graduating students yeah. um you need to be able to put what your expectations are you know right when you join um the degree itself and what do you expect to get out of it when you graduate yeah. You know, because at the, at, the, at the end of the day, it's all academics, right? Yeah. You do research, you publish papers, you implement stuff. That's great. But then if I'm going to hire you as a company, I need to be able to know that I can hire you at a position whereby you can manage some of my security environment. And how can you do that if, you, if, you, if you've not been exposed to that level of um security slash vulnerability slash intrusion and all that you know so it, it's it's actually why it's hard because with a phd once you graduate you expected to join a company and start up at a managerial position you know because that is ex exactly what your degree is is scoped for but then in order for you to be able to manage people to ensure that the security of a company remains the same or it is at the optimal you know you need to have exposure to that yourself and this is the arguments that we had before we actually started the club, that this would benefit a lot of our cybersecurity students. Um, this was also had as um, a good source of, um, at least if you, if you go out there for interviews, a lot of these recruiters, they want to check, they want to ask you, what else have you done other than being a student? You know, because this is very important. How, how can I be so sure that you're a team player? You know, when all you've done is just sitting in classrooms and doing research or by yourself or within like a small group of people, I cannot ascertain those values without seeing something uh, more notable. So I actually had um, um, this interview with a company that is actually one of the uh, top um, five um um, how do they put it now? Fortune five companies, I would say. And um, at the fourth level of the interview, I was actually asked about some of the cyber force um, competitions that we went for. Yeah. And the person was very interested in what actually happened. Um, we saw that you are the captain of the team. How did you manage your team to ensure that you were able to get to where you got to before the timeout? You know, and these are questions that you can't 
up. You can't cook up something for them. You know, th- yeah. this has to be you more of like a re- right. You know, yeah. you need to have experienced it. You know, and the person himself was actually at one of those cyber force competitions that I participated in. Oh, you know, man. so he was aware of what happened, yeah. and he just wanted to know how. You know, because at some point we panicked, right? You know, like from your perspective as being a team member and the team um, captain, what did you do? How did you assist um, your other team members to get back in line? Yeah, you know, and this is just one of those many things that you can benefit from not just being a student, but also having a little bit more um, to learn about the industrial standards. You know, if you want to do, you want to become a pen tester at the end of the day, you cannot become a pen tester without actually having the experience and exposure um, to pen testing, you know. Yeah, you got to have not only the knowledge, you've got to be able to know how to use that stuff. And right. So right. You, you're practicing. You got to have at least something behind you, and have went out a couple of turns somehow to get some of that understanding. It's not just about, well, per se, absorbing something from books and text. Um, you actually got to put it to work a lot of times. So getting that type of experience. Um, you know, in the future, I, I, I think uh, what I'm seeing is a trend in technology or uh, training. And uh, universities are starting to pick up on not only giving you the undergrad coursework and theory and methods, uh, but also implying a boot camp per se, a little different from what boot camps you might think, the whole five-day boot camp idea. I think most people might misconceive what boot camp really particularly thinks is like. This is more like an eight-month add-on to your degree path. Uh, that employs uh, real world um, like professionals to support teaching real labs, things you can put your hands on, uh, nomenclature that you would see every day. There's trends like that starting to come. The University of Michigan has put out something with the uh, Nexus um, and uh, Hacker U, which is now trending, so yeah. called Thrive DX. Anyway, um, very, very, it's changing. Some of the, the some of the nuances where certifications didn't seem to be you know, important or you had one or the other. Now they're looking at, we need to have all the above. So, right. I mean, I, I can understand where if you, if you come out doing a lot of research and then, you know, that, that begs a question, I guess we, we were discussing about that earlier, but um, <laughs> you know, those who, I, and I know there's two different types of degrees. PhDs usually mean more about research. And I know there's, you know, honorable path, to doing research on a long-term basis. Uh, that is one way, and that's how we, we solve problems a lot of times um, with a lot of brilliant individuals working. Um, but then you also have the whole idea of the professional path. Um, and sometimes the professional path is also what the researchers do. Um, but you don't always particularly get that. You could get where individuals in the field either do one or the other. They never consistently try to do both. Where if what you were headed for and what you were expecting seems to be that you were expecting once you got your PhD, you were going to go out and get a real job. And then, then they were thinking, okay, wait a second. You don't have, <laughs> you know, you, where's the experience at? Where you, what were you the doing? Yeah, right. yeah. So I, I can see how you really need to sit down, like you said, and, and think about what, what is the particular outcome for this? I mean, as a graduate student, you, you went through the nuances, all the little different factors of thinking through the process of why am I getting this PhD? What am I going to do with it? What does that mean about afterwards? Um, certainly heavy thought there. Um, definitely put a lot of time and effort in making sure you got it. Um, and it is an honor to have. Um, so I don't want people to think <laughs> that somehow we're, we're saying, don't go get it. No, 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 no. <laughs> it's, it's a reason. There's a reason you do get them. Now, there's also a reason not many people get them. Um, and so um, it's the same thing with and, and and then I think the, 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 the main point here is that if, if you're getting a bachelor's degree, you're getting it because it is a norm for the society, well, especially within the scope of the job that you want to do. 
Yeah. You know, but once you start moving into graduate school, then you need to be very honest with yourself. Yeah. You know, what do I really want to get out of this? It's not just about the time it takes. It's also about how much it's going to cost you to complete that program itself. You know, so oh, I yeah. think the planning is very important. Yeah, I yeah. think it's, it's significance. And a lot of, honestly, a lot of people going into the undergrad coursework, I would have to say, what age are they and just how much did they really think about all these things? And I'm sure the older they get, the more prominent these pieces start to fall into play for them uh, as they uh, experience life more and more every day. So um, my children are now, I got two of them in, in their 2021 now, one that's 17 thinking she's 30. So, uh, <laughs> so congratulations. I'm right trying, trying to understand them. <laughs> Uh, and and how that um, how they're going to survive? Worried about them, mother. Mom's always worried. I'm trying to calm mom down sometimes. <laughs> it's like just just let them go out there. They're going to be fine, you know. And so there's some days we're praying. So I mean, <laughs> it gets crazy, but um, they're fine. They do the great jobs. They're all at college. Uh, one of them's come out of college, so definitely went through the nuances of of trying to get them to understand the importance of thinking through this and what they want to do as a passion and how much that's going to, how much effort, time and resources, money, um, all, all right. the things you got to buy, where you live, what you do, how much experience you're going to need, where you're getting that from, what type of networking with people you want to be like, things like that, what all that means. So um, we're going to take a break right now, Toby. So, um, okay. and we'll be right back after we hear a message from our sponsors. I need a ding or something. <laughs> so I know when to stop talking. <laughs> yeah, but I can see your high work there. Like, it must have noticed that too. <laughs> Let's give that pause real quick, and then I'll come back. Okay, welcome back to New Cyber Frontier. I'm your host, uh, Tim Montgomery, with Toby. What's his name again? I can't, I can't. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just gonna let you go <laughs> on that. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, and usually it's the accent and my uh, forgetful brain, really. But um, anyway, it's nice to have you on, Toby. And uh, before the break, we were, we were talking about um, just kind of the importance on you know what, what we think through as this, as the idea of a PhD comes about, and some of the some of the factors inside the universities. You know, choosing a university choosing the type of uh, curriculum and knowing that, uh, you know, like Toby said, the, the PhD is just, especially for cyber, um, wasn't, isn't everywhere. And there's only specific universities that seem to be trying to uphold this curriculum to, to really get it at that level. Um, so, yeah, certainly. And then knowing the value behind what, uh, you know, how you're going to live, where you're going afterwards and what that means for you. Um, so, well, I, we got into this question, and I'm curious. Uh, <laughs> we were talking about how the professional from the whole researcher avenue, the difference in the two. Um, as professors, in in your experience, uh, did you experience some real major differences between professors that typically never really uh, was in the field as a professional but has been in the field as a researcher and a teacher, an educator for a very long time to get their tenure um, where they sit today as, as their title, a uh, professor, uh, and those who actually have done a lot of uh, background as, as a career in the real field knowledge uh, and then brought that into being teaching. Do you, did you see differences in your professors there? Yeah, there, there is. In fact, that's, that's, a, that's a very, very good uh, question because um, this to um, – individuals as i would like to put them they are they are two different i mean they're on two different sides of the spectrum you know so we have people that actually went straight to school they did their masters you know they did their phd they graduated and then they um, started lecturing and they moved their way all the way up to becoming uh, professors and also we have people that actually graduated from their phd or their graduate uh, program and then they moved to the industry uh, they acquire enough knowledge and while they were about to retire in the industry they decided to join the academia world again now the major differences between the two of them is um, the reality and the expected
augmented reality, as I love to put them, you know, because um, if you've worked in the industry, because your PhD work is supposed to be something that will relate or that will translate to you solving an industrial grade problem. You know, and of course, you need your professor or your advisors, as we normally call them, uh, to be able to guide you on that path, to be able to choose the right um, thesis uh, that you are going to work on for your PhD um, period. Now, think of it from the other side of the spectrum that I am just a strict researcher, which is great. You know, all I've been doing, you know, after my graduate is research and research and research. Now, we all understand that this actually changes with a lot of professors over time, meaning that they reach a certain level in their career that they actually stop doing research because now they have the students to do the research for them. I mean, I think this is also fun. But then the question is how, if you're looking for a mentor, you are not necessarily supposed to be looking for a mentor on both spectrum, meaning looking for industrial mentor and also looking for academic mentor. You, you can actually have only one. And I believe you will agree that we have some of our professors at UCCS that we can actually attribute that to. Yeah. They can tell you what is actually going on in the industry because they keep updated and they have a lot of affiliation with the industry as a whole. And then they can also tell you about research, you know, but there is no good research if your research is not, or if your research does not have an economic importance. You can do a great job working on some research but the question is um what is the outcome of the research how does this help people how does this move that area of research forward and is it something that can be used in the industry or not you know yeah oh yeah certainly uh and i think a lot of people don't uh quite under understand the significance of research sometimes um I, they may take um where individuals may believe that why, why would we call a person a doctor for the significance of research if research is so easy to do? Um, I would have to say from 100 years ago till now, technology and the ability for resourcing information has gotten much easier, true. Um, but scholars way back when definitely um, had a more difficult time trying to gather that research, gather that information, really gleaming uh, the analysis of, of what they have collected. So... The concept, it might have seemed gotten easier, but I think there's more of it out there. So now, uh, in some ways, it's changed to a point where it's, it's been more complicated. So, and we do need the idea of theory to move into, and methods to move into a scenario of something that's applicable. So, you know, right. being able to trend of some kind of physical, tangible thing out of it. I mean, the, the idea of a switch or a router or a a network piecing uh, gear together, uh, just the complexity of how many different uh, research elements went into each piece of that to get it to where it's at today and just how we use it. We may take that for granted somewhat day to day. Um, for most of us don't know what it does or how it works, but we certainly use it every day. We use it for oh, everything yeah. we do now. Um, and if we didn't have them, we certainly wouldn't be doing what we're doing right now. Right. So, I mean, Right. right, that gets right. into that concept, right? So it's certainly something the world needs and doesn't truly understand, and 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 so the other path for the professional side of it certainly is needed as well. The doers, um, so those that are thinkers and those that are doers, and sometimes there's a blend of those in your professors. Uh, sometimes there's ones that uh, only do one side of it. So I did get a chance to meet some of them, and I'm starting to understand a lot of where their background is and and what it is. My advisor. There um, certainly has a major background in teaching and um, research. And so I've I read a lot of his papers, and there's a lot of stuff in there he's done over the years. Uh, certainly sounds like he's a busy guy all the time. So that's crazy. <laughs> uh, so a lot, of, a lot right. of time and effort going into this stuff. And certainly they're smart people. So I'm glad those talents you're using, you know, up to the, to the best of your ability. Uh, otherwise, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to come out with some of the things we – been able to use these days to do what we do today so right um so yeah yeah i i think there is a difference between professors sometimes and i think that's another additive to your um idea of sitting down and kind of thinking through when you get to that phd level and you need an advisor and you're kind of trying to hunt one 
those are some things you kind of need to be thinking about, you know? Like, okay, uh, what's this guy? How did we relate? At least for me, I'm thinking through, what does he do? <laughs> I mean, they usually all have right. a, a very big page <laughs> of what research they do and publishing papers they've got and anything else they do. Um, and you have a conversation with them and usually interview with them. And if you, if you're selective of that, so, um, it's interesting to say the least. Um, so yeah. what kind of tips going into, going into a job like you have now, uh, with, uh, cloud flare, uh, that picked right. you up over the last year. Or so from a PhD's perspective, I guess, you know, when they hired you, they knew you had a PhD. I mean, did they have a expectation or, and then when, I mean, uh, there's quite a few things in there I can think of, but did they have an expectation of somehow you were going to come change the whole planet and, you know, somehow you're this <laughs> brainiac or something like that. I mean, what did, what did they say about having a PhD when you showed up? So I think, um, well, I will start with most of the other interviews that I've done, uh, before the interview at a uh, Cloudflare, um, Every time I get on an interview, and um, I I always do my research. Again, this just uh, I mean, it just comes from the aspect of me being a researcher. So before I get on any interview, I will know who you are, you know, to the very T of anything that I can find on the internet, yeah. you know. And then um, my first point of view, this is not actually to throw down um, the aspect of having a PhD, but this is more to let people know that you should not judge me because of what I have. I expect you to look at me from the aspect of what can I do? Yeah. You know, so um, I always let them know because a lot of them will ask you, like, you have a PhD, you could be a professor anywhere you want. Yeah. I mean, you could, you could do a lot of things. Um, I mean, you could work in different places why here yeah okay. you know and then i always let them right you know and i always make them understand that i do have a phd because i have plans of having a phd for the future yeah you know i i love teaching people you know i i love impacting knowledge because i believe that um the only way you can truly um note that you've learned something is by actually teaching it to someone else, yeah. you know, but in order to be able to teach it to someone else, you need to actually have substance. Yeah. And the in experience. terms of substance, right, the experience, right? Yeah. And this is where the industry uh, comes in. We, we want to learn this. We want to bring all this good stuff. We want to um, get to par with the industry in terms of what their requirements are. Yeah. And then by that time, you can now go back to the academic world and then help young researchers, you know, find their path into the industry moving forward, you know, because yeah. at the end of the day, when, when I um, finally interviewed with Cloudflare, I, I did have that question about uh, my PhD, like, you know, what are my expectations yeah. with, with me having a PhD and all that. And um, um, I made it very clear that my, PhD does not really fat on into um, the job interview that we're having today. You know, I'm, I'm coming to you because I've, I've, I know that I have something to offer, you know, and if you also believe that you've got something to offer, then I think at that point we've reached a compromise, you know, because then we're both bringing something to the table. Yeah. Now, if I want to be called a doctor every day of my life, I'll become a professor. And even if I become a professor, I don't believe in people, you know, calling me a doctor. Yeah. You know, I would rather prefer you make it simple. Call me Toby, you know. Yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, I know. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a medical doctor now, so yeah, you know. And, and I'm not a medical doctor as right. well. So, but... And this actually comes back to understanding what exactly you want out of the program. Now, if you ask me as the PhD program, as it shaped my life in any way, I mean, as it blown my mind beyond measures. Yes. In fact, way, way beyond my expectation, you know, because what I learned doing the PhD program 
is more than I could have ever imagined. One, it gives you the ability to actually, if not for anything, to start something and complete it. You know, that, that, is, that is one major thing that you can beat, you know, yeah. anywhere else, you know. And secondly, um, I always joke with my other colleagues that um, if, if you know there is a problem, the problem is 50% solved. Now, if you portray this, if you translate this to your PhD program, then that tells you that you've been able to find a problem, a gap in research alone. You've done like 50% of the work. And that tells you it's not even, it's not something that is easy to do because you have to ingest a lot of paper. You know, you need to be able to comprehend with the status quo of research that other colleagues and senior colleagues of yours have already done. And you, it's like you're looking for that one spot that you can say that, oh, this is a gap in research. This can actually be improved. Well, with PhD, you can actually improve Proof stuff. You're supposed to look for a very um, new aspect of research, you yeah. know. But as we all know, in computer science, we don't we don't reinvent the wheels anymore. We just build on what we already have. No disrespect to my computer <laughs> science. Reinnovate yeah. the wheels. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> That's the new term, right? <laughs> so yep. you're looking to make something better than we are already using it as, or looking for a different way to use it. Um, which right. then imposes simplicity to others, uh, making life a little more simple. Um, well, Toby, I think we're running out of time. Uh, is there any last mo uh, minute words that you would like to give to our audience um, about your, your story? Um, well, experience? yeah, well, uh, I guess my last word, um, well, it would probably be a sentence. It would be more like, if you ever start something, and um, I think the biggest problem that we have is failure. You know, people not understanding how to treat failure, you know, um, and I, I have failed a lot. I've, I've had to deal with my own level of failures, you know. We hope you have enjoyed this episode of New Cyber Frontier. Remember to get involved. Often we think that someone else will handle privacy and security in the virtual world, but you are the only one truly in command of your virtual fate. Join our mailing list so we can keep you informed of breaking news and new releases. If you have an idea, if you have a question that you would like to hear answered, or if you want to get involved with our efforts, reach out to us at NewCyberFrontier.com. We also encourage you to visit our sponsors' links as they are the ones that really make this show possible. I want to thank each of you for supporting the show, and we look forward to seeing you back for the next episode of New Cyber Frontier.